Chapter 7 Warfare and Brotherhood And after a while, though haunted by the initial telling of the Master's Tale, I did not worry so much. I carried on in my assumptions, moving toward the paths of Korani Zeal along with my brothers. Soon I played with sticks, our swords, with Darlian, play fighting and imagining my own greatness as a Korani warrior. It was customary for boys older than nine to gather around a bonfire beneath the starlit sky. Some of the older, adolescent boys would tend to the fire, while others beat large drums and formed a circle. Nearby, girls gathered to dance and sing, and the boys would call each other out and fight with training swords. This formal occasion of challenge among the youths was called Enhenyek, which means yield. This is how young boys would eventually become fighters and some, those not already arranged to marry, husbands. Those who won the contest were acknowledged and usually taken under the wings of the older boys, young captains, who led light patrols around Archaea, guarding our crops and shifts alongside older, more mature soldiers. The most accomplished of these captains would get first choice of who to add to their group, their Enhenyek. Both Botage and Minot were captains and the most popular. During Enhenyek, the contest was simple. Stay in the circle and defend yourself against your opponent. Points were given for good clear strikes. The one with the most points won. If a contestant ran out of the circle, they lost. Those who lost kept developing their skills, hoping to be accepted. Those who won participated in the next level of the competition, fighting members of other captains' groups in games such as Conquest, in which each team must defend a herd of cattle from the invading teams who tried to steal them. Also, variations of this game, in which the object to steal or defend was a mere flag. The campaigns would go on in summer heat, beneath the moons once a week. The games went to dawn until winter and the rainy months. I did not participate happily. Uncoordinated and generally timid, I did poorly. I felt ashamed as my elder brothers watched me continually lose to lesser families, as my brother Botage put it. I started out confident. But then I would find myself on my back, outside the circle and eating the dirt dealt to me by my opponent. Minot, always sensing when I was on the edge of giving up, would pick me up, brush me off, and say, Jashoya, it doesn't matter, it's just a game. And that is the point of being a warrior, to not give up. Stay in the game. Stay in the circle. Minot always encouraged me this way. How could a Korani prince be so obviously bad at holding his own in a fight? I wondered. I was terrified that I was inherently a coward. It was just then I became sensitive to being called by my nickname, Jishoya. It irritated me to hear it from my brothers as though it implied I was a simpleton. It made me feel reduced. I did not recognize that what the master had been telling me about John D. was playing out in a slow boil of my life. I did not note that the spell of self-imagery was taking shape within me so strongly. During the peaks of my frustration, I would avoid the circle, and I told my mother, I'd rather be with you most times. It's quiet, and there are plenty of interesting things to do. My mother would laugh, draw me near her as we walked, hold me to her side and sigh. Dear Vivian, you can't do this your whole life. You cannot avoid what is uncomfortable. In life, you must fight, and you must endure the fighting of others. 
She nudged me away. Toward and Henyeg, the circle of boys. I tried my best to do what Minot taught me. Keep your guard up. Watch your hands. Focus. Block. Watch your head. But I was awful. Getting black eyes, split lips, and torn clothing from savage opponents who had much to prove against a Korani prince in the open circle. I loathed it. And then eventually, I slipped away. Minot would let me go, saying, uh, c c Cool off. Uh, don't worry, j uh, Jishibian. Come back when you are ready. Gone were the blissful threads of morning light abandoned, and instead I woke to each day as a problem. I worried that I would never grow, improve, and rather suffer great insult in the circle. Away from the circle, I spent time basking on the rocks, trying to forget about it, making Anya laugh by crossing my eyes, or searching the nearby thickets for insects, my hobby of sorts. In the evening, I could hear the aunts and uncles whispering, he clings to his mother still, Tomak said to my father, and I knew my father's opinions of my talent. A bit soft and scattered, Kolrani Ta would mumble. Perhaps he'll grow out of it. Suan will spoil him if she keeps indulging him, said Tomak in the dining hall where my father ate only with his general. They are right, Master Payan said one day. You cannot hide from life. But you said I should do what I want, I protested. True, but you must have balance. You must do your duty, and you must face your fears. You should want to examine yourself here. <sighs> but I'm so bad, and everyone laughs. <laughs> do you see me bent out of shape? Because no one... Not a single soul in the kingdom is interested in enlightenment. <laughs> the master roared with laughter, slapping the low table top that we sat before in his deej, where I oftentimes visited him. His laughter was so loud that the parrots in the distant trees mimicked him. I only grimaced and averted my eyes, now a stubborn nine-year-old. <laughs> Do you hear me going on about how bad a master I am? <laughs> oh, that's funny. What if one day I decided to not show up? Would that strike you as odd? It would be strange to you if Ashuta herself appeared to me and I went on saying, Boo-hoo, great goddess, the Tar and the chiefs laugh at me because they don't believe in enlightenment. <laughs> He teased me, mercilessly, until I relented and began to laugh with him. <laughs> Fighting is simple. It is not personal. Face your opponent. Face him. Who cares? Who wins? For who is winning anyway? That's the most interesting question there. You're not using the tools I have given you. By facing it head on, and not trying to escape, at least you will discover if you can fight, and if you really can't, then you can explore other options besides fighting. Running is not the answer. You see, you want a victory and are embarrassed by a defeat. Now you look to your mom and to me to do what? <laughs> to fix it for you? To hide you away and keep you safe? Who are you anyway that a victory or defeat matters? What does this mistake of assuming a you remind you of? <laughs> he chided. The first princess, I replied, now seeing my mistake. Yes, so stick close to my nod and just do the best you can. Ugh, you are a worrying soul, aren't you? So desperate to fit in. I'm telling you, fitting in is a confinement. Do not worry so much. I did what he told me, and eventually learned what it meant to hold my ground. 
Eventually, I came to understand and enjoy an aspect of myself that I and others assumed was not there. With green face paint around my eyes, I accepted the circle of the boys, and soon I enjoyed the passion of the booming drums, the chanting girls, and the shouts of the other boys. This did not mean I was a champion by any means, and during my worst defeats, it was still my tendency to run to my mother. Still, with Payan's teaching, I accepted my place among the boys and with my insides uncoiled a bit, and with coaxing by my peers, we adventured. Minot and Botage often promised, threatened more like, to take us beyond Archaea's gates, far to the north, to the nook. This was beyond where the outer stockade was complete, and minor skirmishes broke out from time to time. My father stopped building the outer wall when the master brought him back to his senses, a topic Botage and Minot never stopped debating. The outer wall, a very incomplete circle, and an insane undertaking as it was, only met between the cities of Kamana and Hanaga. There was only a portion, a few miles beyond both cities, its use now only as a large watchtower to see approaching Mayok, should they ever plot to invade our cities again. Botage and Minot often romanticized making a trip to this wild area. Though they were more responsible now, their rebellious side often gave way to these kinds of plans, to dares and to double dares. They were not stupid, though, knowing that, as heirs to our father's crown, they should not endanger us all by pursuing foolish games. They planned for months, and then one day they came crashing into our quarters to tell us, We'll go tomorrow! We made that first excursion with perfect execution, and we enjoyed ourselves and each other's company, and so we made a ritual of it. Our camaraderie was strong, each of us, the terrible six, now able to ride and willing to brave where our eldest led us. Our enjoyment of such excursions did not last long, though. Soon, the rivalry between Minot and Botage began to darken the whole affair. One would assert leadership over the other, and then, of course, the rest of us were forced to choose sides. One fateful day, our alliances seemed to be set, made for the rest of our lives. We traveled to the nook that day and rested by a spot by the lake, our favorite, that was surrounded by yellow cliffs. Wild plants clung to the edges of a calm pond that our mares drank from, as Botage and Minot left us behind to scout our perimeter. Nothing much happened by way of danger in these trips, but today we were surprised by the appearance of Mayok. As Nanui drank, I brushed her and hummed to myself. Darlian was squatted over the water, cooling off, when I heard him gasp. Jishoya. I looked to where he was pointing across the river and up into the cliffs. <laughs> Seleth was nearby, tending to his Mera, treetop, and quickly ran over to Darlian to smack his pointing hand downward. He then turned his back to the spying figure Darlian had spotted. Don't point, don't point, don't point, he said. Kuba then said in a hushed tone, He didn't see Seleth. His back was turned. Kuba immediately gathered his things and mounted his Mera, Jester, to find our brothers. Be quick, Kuba, Seleth said. Okay, he said galloping off. The Mayok warrior 
At the top of the cliff was holding a spear, and he peered down at us, his hand over his brow. We pretended not to notice him as Seleth suggested, to not act alarmed. But then another Mayak appeared. My heart raced with what might have been morbid curiosity, a mixture of both dread and excitement. The warrior spied on us, then disappeared from the ledge. We did not know what to do, but Seleth acted with bravery, helped us gather our nerves and prepare for whatever was beyond the ridge. It was not long before we heard the sound of hooves approaching, a cacophony coming from two directions. Seleth, the only one of us armed with anything better than a worn or rusted dagger, stood his ground. From the north entrance of the sandy bank, the Mayak appeared, two of them fast approaching us. They were wild, faces scrawled with white paint. Then behind us, our brothers emerged from the south entrance, wielding their scimitars. Seleth fell in with us as Botage and Minot rode before us. It was a tense standoff with Maris circling, rising to their hind legs and almost locking horns in challenge. I trembled thinking my brothers might die before my very eyes, as I saw the strength of the Mayak warriors, their thick arms and deep cheekbones and hard-set eyes. They were fully grown men and had the air of seasoned warriors. The leader wore several feathers and his straight hair. He looked at his comrade as if confused by my brother's behavior, as if a mistake had been made. He then said words to him, and the two backed off, pulling the reins of their animals to show they were not hostile. This gesture seemed obvious to us, a truce. It seemed obvious to Minot, too. The two Mayak pulled away, their backs turned momentarily as they tried to swing around to achieve greater distance between my brothers. Only Botage took this with either insult or as an opportunity to attack. On the back of Onyx, Botage lunged for them. Minot yelled at him, and so having been warned, the leader quickly turned and thwarted Botage's attack easily with an open palm, sending my brother to the ground. Minot then dismounted and ran for Botage where the two fought. Botage in a frantic rage trying to re-engage the Mayak leader. Minot and Botage exchanged awful blows, and I could not stand it any longer and so rode out alone on Nanui to them and shouted at them. I was between my brothers and the Mayak who were laughing at us. Darlian and Kuba then came to me, shouting for me to get away from the dangerous killer Mayak, <laughs> who only sat in their saddles enjoying the scene of the eldest of the Korani princes trying to kill one another. Kuba jumped off of Jester and stood between them, and Minot pushed Botage back hard and cursed at him. You are such an imbecile, he growled. Botage, obviously embarrassed that we were protecting the Mayan from him, simply spat on the ground and dusted himself off. Seleth fell in behind Botage. What do they want? Seleth said. Whose side are you on, my not? Botage growled. Look at their face paint, you idiots. They are ambassadors. They wear Father Cipher. Minot yelled, wiping blood from his lip, then spoke with the leader and apologized. The leader then put his hands up, nodded, and pointed to the white mark, a leaf painted on his armband, 
a red dot in the center. There was indeed a story behind their presence in the nook. The leader spoke to Minot, and as he did, I focused in on the language. I very much wanted to learn it. As Botash typically ignored all talks of peace, he did not know that these men traveled from the mountains bearing gifts for our father. He did not know that the mark that they wore was to protect them should others, aside from the Korani party sent from Archaea to meet them, find them first. Minot, who took all protocol seriously, knew most of this and was only surprised by their presence. Despite the embarrassment suffered by having to deal with Botage, Kuba and Darlian and I respected Minot and saw his actions as more wise. This infuriated Botage. I would pay later. I knew it. The Mayak leader, Thessaron, told Minot in his own tongue that they were a party of six. Three had been killed by tigers that attacked the cattle they brought as a gift. They were unable to find the Kalrani party they were to meet, and so, when they picked up on our trail, they naturally thought we were that party. Thessaron was shocked to learn that we were royal heirs, and he almost seemed to chide Minot for endangering us. Mind-boggling and stupid were the words that I could translate from the dialect. Minot sighed as he nodded. We agreed to protect and drive the cattle south with them as far as Kamena. We met the third member of the Mayak party, who guarded the remaining cattle, at least 60 head. On the way, Botaj glared at me, his deep, dark eyes on me like a panther. Kuba and Darlin received the same treatment. We left Thessaron and his party at Kamena, where they would rest and feed themselves and the cattle while in the care of the warlord Tanis, who was expecting their arrival. Before we departed, it was expressed by Thessaron that since the Archaean party was nowhere to be found, Minot should escort them the rest of the way to Archaea the next day. Thessaron did not feel welcomed by Tanis and his men, and worry treachery would befall him and his men. Minot agreed and sent Botage, Kuba, Darlian, and me home. Obviously the worst arrangement in my view. Botage reluctantly obliged Minot, and we left immediately for Archaea. The whole journey back, Botage terrorized us. When Kuba tried to defend us, Botage shouted at him, pulled his hair and pushed him off his Mera, breaking his arm. Having made an example of him, Botage then pointed at me, called me a peacemaking woman, and told me to stop my whining after slapping me. Poor Darlin was frozen stiff as we rode Nanui. We were a broken party following the tyrant who purposefully led us the long way home so that under the dim light of the moons he could abandon us. Halfway home. From that day, nothing was ever the same between us. Only vile competitiveness and abuse remaining. When we arrived at the royal dish, Darlian and I tiredly put our Mera in the stable. I then went into our home and upon seeing my mother ran for her. She embraced me. I buried my face in her neck. What is the matter? Suan asked. I could not answer for fear of more mistreatment from Botage. I heard Minot yelling in the background from the main section of the dish. As it turned out, the party my father dispatched to the Mayak had arrived moments after we pushed off with Botage. Minot and Seleth, relieved of their obligation to Thessaron, took the short way back. 
Bullshit! It was not a seven-hour journey. Then there was another voice. Botosh, answering nonchalantly, barely audible. Then why is Kuba's arm broken? Why is Jashuya running to mother? You want broken brothers to be king over? These are your games! Minot yelled. Screw your goddamn circle of brothers concept. Before I came back, no one questioned my competence. If they were good riders, Kuba would have stayed on Jester's back, and he would have kept up. Botage retorted. Why do you hate everyone and everything? I do not hate them. I just do not paint the world with fluffy clouds like you do. Right. Just the dark ones. You have no honor. Breaking their spirits. You do not serve them, just yourself. I don't answer to you. You are just a woman, Minot. A weak-minded woman who keeps his brothers needlessly on the tit. When will you wake up from your idealistic dreams of... Then we heard the tussle, the breaking of objects, the scattering of servants, and the overturning of furniture. We knew fists were flying. Then we heard the voices of onlookers, all shocked at such behavior. Aunt Nandi rushed into the parlor wielding a fighting staff of tied heavy bamboo. She struck mercilessly. Get up! Get out! And this was the way our lives were then. I loved my brothers, even Botage. There were days of sunshine, wild abandon, and camaraderie. And then there were these days, like this, dark, full of awful competitiveness. Feeling dark inside the next day, I hid from the circle of boys again. Sitting on the edges of my mother's bed, she comforted me and listened as I lamented. I don't much like being alive, I said. Don't say that, Jashibian. Why would you say that? Um, because everything is hard and no one loves? What's the point of being alive if tigers eat you and your brothers beat you up? Suan laughed, knowing me to be a dramatist. I did not hate life, but was merely venting, frustrated by its terms. She stroked my hair and then asked, What do you think the master would say to your tantrum here? I shifted my eyes to one side, looking at the clay floor and its embedded green and yellow tiles. I thought a moment and then said, Well, he, he'd say, The point of love, young Korani, is not to just have pleasure in your life, but to learn how to love in spite of your displeasure. I threw in a few hand gestures that I knew the master would make. Suan's eyes lit up and she clasped her hands and <laughs> erupted with a barely suppressed laugh at my impersonation. <laughs> ah, yes, I think so, I think so, Suan sighed. <laughs> Do you think he'd say that? I wondered. And I smiled at my mother, challenging her to suppress her laughter, but she could not. <laughs> yes, I think it's good that you can imitate him so well. Why? Mm. Because it means you've noticed how wise he is, and you love him. And I'm glad that I can see that in you. Hm. No one treats the master the way Botage does. Oh, you don't think people have tried to mistreat him? Suan said. Her eyes sparkled and narrowed. She seemed to hold on to a secret she was now willing to share with me. Who? I asked. Your father, of course, she said. Really? I said sarcastically. So then, I can assume by your tone you know this. Oh, yes, worse than young Botage, really, but do you know how the master acted? 
No. The master acted with bravery of the supreme warrior, Jishoya. A bravery that no man in this land has yet to know. And in that moment I wanted to know what sort of bravery this was. My eyes were locked on my mother's as I waited for her to elaborate. A bravery that held to the truth so much that Kol Rani Ta could never lie to himself. Your father recognized that it was indeed the awful treatment given to Payan that Payan returned to him in the form of truth and that he had a lot to learn about love. Do you know what that says about the power of love despite our displeasure? I said nothing, only waited for the answer, thirsty for it, that it can change even the darkest hearts though it may take years, decades, lifetimes. It changes that heart to want to give love more than receive. It changes you, son, if you choose that over your comfort. No sword or armor will ever compare to this, my darling. It is unbeatable. So think on that the next time you want to throw a tantrum about the discomfort of life. I smiled. My mother gazed at me and caressed my cheek with her finger. She then pointed to the entrance of a room, instructing me to leave. So, do not hide in here with me, Jishoya. Be in the world, your world of rotten brothers, <laughs> stinky meras, dust, bug bites, swords and armor, and learn to love it despite the displeasure. Listen to the master and do as he has already shown you, my sweet one. Okay? Okay, I said, then ran out of her room. That particular night, I knew the master was back from his travels and would be in my father's council chambers. So I ran down the dark lower passageway, slipping in between the shadows untouched by the evenly placed torches that hung on the vine-covered wall that led to the lower depths of our dish. Along the way, I danced. Restored to my humor, I wondered happily if my heart could change in the way Suan told me it should. What was the supreme warrior? What kind of bravery could withstand all disappointment in life that did not require a thirst for brutality and acts of conquest and retaliation? Was it real? wanted to know. I hoped for it. Prayed for it. I would go straight back to the circle of boys if I could become that. I danced to a rhythm in my heart that led me to the master. I traced my finger along the complex patterns of the tapestries that hung on the cold great stones of the walls below. I could hear the voices of Master Payan, Minot, my father, and the two Mayak we met days earlier. In the hallway I sat with my back against the wall beneath the torch by a curtain that hung over the entrance. I gazed upward at the two massive stone statues opposite me and right before the curtain entryway, sculptures of massive tigers baring their teeth, their large granite eyeballs glaring at me. It was a twin representation of Tiaga, the tiger goddess. 
I gawked at them for some time, and then I peeked beneath the tapestry to get a look inside court. Come in, Jashoya, I heard the master call. I was never good at concealing myself. I parted the curtain and entered. There was laughter as I did. If you were not so loud in your dancing, you might have stayed hidden. But why hide such joy? The master said, grinning. My father glanced at me and smiled. He seemed to be enjoying the same rhythmic tune playing in my heart, which was spurned by my thirst to be in Payan's company. Delightful thirst. I swayed back and forth, happily. I came inside as was commanded by Payan, and I was met by the pressing eyes of onlooking strangers. The two Mayak warriors, my brother and I encountered, were standing before Kolrani Ta. Two others were among them who I had not seen before. They all grinned at me as I sheepishly entered pushing past the spear-wielding Bakuela guards and into the clouds of incense within the interior. All of the lords were present, all seated, and all dressed formally in brocade caftans and backed by their standards and the fourteen men in each entourage. The entirety of the Korani nation was represented in a grand multicolored crescent of seated bodies before my father and the four Mayak. Payen stood near my father. Minot stood by the leader of the Mayak, and between them and my father was gold, spilling out of metal cases and onto the beige tiles, a measure I had never seen in all my life. One could say it was a significant amount of all Mayak wealth. There was a chuckle at my wide-eyed beholding of it. My son, the dancer. My father teased, introducing me to the hall. Minot translated what my father had just said to the other Mayak. Their eyes narrowed because of their wild smiles. They stood, elegant figures, pure, wild, ringed ears, straight, braided hair, necklaces made of animal teeth, and skirts of leather. I shrank in embarrassment, but Kolrani Ta beckoned me, his many ruby-ringed fingers curling gently against his wide palms as a gesture for me to come in and take a seat on a vacant cushion by his side. He was warm to me. I went to him. The Mayak leader, Thessaron, resumed speaking to the Ta, glancing at me and laughing as Mina translated. Nkosi, your youngest son has a very good heart. I would be proud to call him my own, Mina translated, and then he winked at me. Through these four men, two of which bowed Taj nearly cut down, Unat. The Ta of the Mayak had sent his regards to both my father and Master Payan. Peace was being made. I was overcome by happiness and noted how Payan seemed to glow that evening. He agrees, the Mayak reaffirmed. Twelve families of Mayak and twelve of Korani, and a mixed force to keep the order for five years. This is acceptable. Unat Mayakta agrees to this and the rules presented to govern the town. The cattle the Mayak brought were an offering, repayment for the many years of raids on Katik ranchers in the east. The gold, many trunks of it, presented before my father that night, was repayment for damage done to fields. My father was overcome by this gesture. By Payan's work, by his travel to convince Unat, the Mayak were now ready to end the old conflict. The Nook 
our former playground, was now to be mutually shared territory. For centuries, our tribes fought to control this region. Both Taz agreed now that an equal number of families would settle there. If the peace lasted, then the Kolrani would consider intermingling further south, opening their borders in years to come. It was a radical plan, again, one that Payen was behind, for as the terms of the agreement were discussed in this final moment, my father struggled. It was the warlords gave him pause. They looked on disapprovingly. I understand this is difficult, but the idea of Mayak and Kolarani coexisting must come to this event. It is you who must bridge the divide. Time will not do it for you, Master Payan said. His hands turned upward. How else could it happen except by agreeing to intermingle? Share what is given on the Great One Land. And it must be done right now because there will never be a more convenient time, and you cannot wait until the noble lords become agreeable to this plan. Mayak and Korani must eventually become something different, undivided. So what is that? How do we approach it? I can show you, Payan said, Maina translating to the Mayak. He then walked further out into the room addressing everyone. Great men destroy the confines of tradition by believing more in the truth, in less than this cheapened standard of their swords that we live by. These destroyers are truly great, Taz. You see, the metaphor of the sword is truth, temperance, community, cooperation, not of revenge and obstinate politicization, not of mere conquest, as you've mistaken it for. Vulnerability is what fuels true living. Vulnerability. It can be done, but only if we cut through these political obstructions we've created among ourselves. Minot again translated as Payan glanced at the section of the room where the Lord sat, their arms folded, their heads shaken and stubborn doubt. My father sighed and said, But there's been so much Korani blood spilled in the nook. Yes, brother, let us now forgive the debt of an eye, a tooth, a leg, a life. All of it forgiven and agree to start again. You worry, how will these lords react? When told, we must change. What will they withhold from Akaya? How will they align themselves against me? Your mind searches for an answer in the darkness of a future. I say that it does not matter what these chiefs think if you are entirely aligned to me. If you are aligned to me, that future does not exist, and so therefore there is nothing to fear. And there was a laugh from among the crowd, a deep, sinister chuckle. Payan's words were seen as a direct challenge by the lower chiefs, the mayors, and wealthy citizens from the outlying towns who scoffed in their protest. They wanted to continue to profit from the war machine. Their agitated sounds began to resonate within the court. Lord Dajai of Katik rose and turned to look into the crowd with a stern face, silencing them all. Botaj Ta, do you doubt me? Do you? Doubt that I could withstand their reaction against the policy of truth? Have I not already demonstrated strength, love, and utter reliance upon the truth? I ask you as well, Chief Tanis, Shakuba, 
Chobaza, Bambazu, and Dajai. Dajai came forward on his knees, bowed to my father, and said, I will follow you and Payan and Kosi. His words are saying, Another faceless voice shouted, and Dajai rose again, hand on hilt of his sword at his waist, challenging his accuser with sharpened eyes, staring through an orange band of ceremonial paint across his eyes. He wore a slender, mid-thigh-length black caftan, gold patterns across his shoulders, and a striking set of golden eagle wings displayed across his chest. His mane of hair was decorated with dyed feathers, gathered and tight neatly in three sections by golden bands into a singular braid. The room was silent as Dajai again, by right, sought out his accuser, walking the smooth tiles of the front row on golden sandals. My father patiently awaited the outcome. No one dared challenge Dajai. When every pair of eyes was looked into by the Lord of Katik, they averted. It was then settled. Satisfied, Dajai again seated himself. On their knees, Chobaza and Bambazu both came forward, bowed, said in turn, I will follow you and Payan and Kosi. My father's nostrils flared as he leaned forward, his eyes narrowing upon the master, a smile coming to his lips. You never cease to amaze me. You are right, Master Payan. This will be done. I have been wrong. I do not doubt you it shall be done. As they all roared, the Bakuwila pressed more deeply into the room, and as Minot screamed the translation of my father's words to the Mayak, who then smiled, shocked. They, then all four of them, stretched themselves onto the floor. My father was again overcome, not believing his eyes, and he was so inspired, he removed his crown, stepped from his bench, and gathered the Mayak leader up, embraced him, and kissed his cheeks. I watched the northern lords, Tanis and Shokaba, rise, twenty-eight men behind them, and bowed. The lords and their retinue walked out of the court entrance in protest. Later that festive night there was laughter throughout the dish. The servants were kept up late preparing food and playing music. Our cavernous parlors were full, the stoves roaring and glowing with warmth. The Mayak ambassadors entertained and made drunk. The entire family was assembled, uncles and aunts and cousins and grandparents, all telling stories about our meeting, Master Payan. For the first time ever, I saw my father holding my mother close to him. She beamed as she looked into his eyes as if the man she fell in love with had finally returned. The rains began that day, a torrential downpour of the monsoon season, marking a period that seemed to clear the way for a new time, a prolonged peace. The main family room, a large torchlit area over which an ornate wooden frame held up the vine roof, was loud with the sound of the downpour. There were several tables covered with fruit brought in that would have otherwise spoiled in the warm rain. The floor was smooth clay tiles, and my younger cousin slid across it in their play. I snatched a banana from a table, chased my cousins for a short spell, and then joined my brothers and parents in one of the smaller parlors tucked behind the family room. They were talking openly and with humor. Their respective ghosts somehow had disappeared, outshined by the glow of the master who was in the center of the room. The conversation shifted to the future, and Master Payan again reassured my father that to worry about civil war was useless. The chiefs being stirred up 
is inevitable, even without talk of peace, to aggravate them. The Kolarani nation has gotten too big. Your empire will eventually divide as the continuity of ideas takes on different shades along different lines. All, all can divide peacefully or not. It scarcely matters. This is not about the outcome of your empire. It, it is about your enlightenment, your freedom. The peace that matters is that peace, the peace that I am. As I looked at my father, I realized that Kolrani Ta had left his crown on his jade and ivory bench. He had forgotten it, distracted by Payan's work, distracted in regarding the Mayak, who had bowed to him that evening as brothers. For that evening my father was free, happy, as if Payan had removed an obstruction without my father knowing. Just as I made that observation, Payan glanced at me and winked. And we were quiet. I swayed loving Payan as he radiated, and everyone just looking at him in silence. He was perfect, so unlike my father or me. If Lords Tanis and Shakuba plot against you, so be it. If they ride upon Arkaya, we will defend ourselves. There is no point worrying about what they think. But I knew my father would again worry. I could feel his pattern coincident with my own. My need for a crown of sorts. He would again become self-conscious and seek his crown out. I knew this just as I began to know myself to be the same. In viewing my father, I saw my own reflection. I did not worry about a fence being torn down, but rather that I would not have one. Though on the surface I wanted to know what the supreme warrior was, how that concept could be real, how it could change me, I secretly conspired to exploit it, to make a life that was painless and to serve to create my own fence of invincibility. Payan knew, and with a wink reflected this back to me. I indeed fantasized about being the supreme warrior, full of vigor and grace, never wrong, never in need, as I played in the forests and in the cavernous underbelly of our royal Dij. This, of course, was the shadow of Jandi, as I dreamt who I would become. Chapter 8 The Threat of Mandi One day, nearing the end of my ninth year, I was playing by the streams with my sisters. I had found the most vibrantly colored butterfly, its wings a beautiful pattern of oranges, turquoise, and dark blue. It let me get close enough to see it, but never close enough to capture it satisfactorily with my eyes. From behind me, I heard my sisters splashing each other in the water. Suan moved from her sunning rock into the depths of the pond. I watched her for a moment as she untied her hair and moved waist-deep into the water. Her skin, richly deep brown, as she waited, she wringed her wet hair and then spread it over her shoulders. She saw me from below and waved at me. I smiled and then resumed my pursuit. The butterfly doubled back and I chased it down the small hill. 
I was intent on studying it. It flitted to a deeply shady and moisty spot beyond some shrubbery. As I circled around it to catch a glimpse, I stumbled on a rock and fell, and then I heard the rock overturn. Something, an animal, snapped twigs and ran away. I heard it making a commotion along the path downhill, but could not really see it as it moved beneath the leaves. I brushed myself off and then saw my winged friend a few feet from me. It flew again, further downhill, and I gave chase. Finally, it alighted on a rock by the creek. Beyond the small boulder I could see Anya washing her feet and my mother was approaching her. I then focused on the butterfly, my two hands ready to catch it when I pounced. I jumped and missed, but then something was aroused. It hissed. I fell onto my back and it was right before me, a large asp. Its crimson hood majestically flared. I could not move. It stared at me. From the corner of my right eye, I saw another one near Anya. Her back was turned to it. She turned and it struck her. I tried to scream, but only managed a gasp, compelled to be silent by the one before me. Be still or die. It seemed to say so clearly. Anya was struck again, and she then screamed and cried. She stomped and was struck again. My mother ran toward her. Anya! Suan screamed. Nandi! She scooped up Anya only to be struck by the snake herself. It did not slither off, but circled, slithered over the water, and then struck my mother again. My mother screamed. The world seemed to shatter. I was paralyzed with fear. I could not bear to look at what was actually happening. I stared into the eyes of the snake that promised to kill me should I move. You are... you are Jandi, I thought. In my panic, it answered with a hiss. She did not like being named. My aunt could be heard running toward me. I heard her halt in her horror as she saw me pinned below. Oh, oh Jeshoya, don't move, Nandi whispered. I did not move. Every fiber of my being worked against the reflex to flee. Stay there. Do not flinch, Nandi warned. You are John D. Leave us alone. You are John D. Leave us alone. I thought again, terrified but willing to receive her sting as an answer, as there was no escape. The snake hissed again, wavered, retracted her hood, and then followed her sister, Mandi, into the bushes. My aunt rushed to me and grabbed my hand. The servants rushed my sister indoors, and Nandi accompanied my mother and me. Go, Ranita! The servants shouted. They rushed to get him. We placed my sister and my mother on beds, desperately cleaned the wounds and tied off their limbs. The servants cut out and pressed out the poison, sucked it out, used herbs, prayed, screamed and howled. But my sister died within one hour. Nandi and the other aunts and cousins, lamenting, carried her body away. My mother lay in bed. She suffered and cried from losing her daughter. I held her hand throughout the night. She looked at me in the dim glow of candlelight, her breathing labored. But she gripped my hand. Her mouth grew dry, her eyes red. As the sun began to rise from morning, she said my name. Jishibian, I must go now. Please don't go, mother. Please. 
Please, I pleaded, feeling helpless. Where's the master? I asked, looking around me. No one could answer. He was away. Please don't go, mother. I prayed. Please, oh, shoot her, please. I stayed close to her. My father sat next to me. As my grit tightened on Suan's hand, hers lessened on mine. Mother! I cried, shaking her hand. He no longer gripped back. My father took me toward him, held me, a forearm against my chest. You must accept it, Shoya, Koranita lamented. No, you must. Please, I pleaded for the last time, and then I died inside. After the ceremonial three days, we cremated Suan and Anya's bodies. I can now look upon that day in hindsight as bittersweet as it began with a whimsical chase for the colorful hues and tones of life and ended with the blackness of my sister's and my mother's death. I was learning that comfort is fleeting in this real world, full of just as much tragedy as victory. I could not understand that happiness itself was independent of these events. Instead, like my father, I reached my hands into the rose bushes of my self-entitlement and was pricked by the thorns of my resentment. I thought, Ashuta, why? Why did you betray me? Why did you take my beloved mother and my sister so cruelly? I was angry, so angry. Why did you make me so helpless that I could do nothing but be still and accept my mother's fate? Had I not heard the master's story of the first brothers, of how they each demanded Ashuta's grace rather than accept what was given, did I forget what my mother had told me about the supreme warrior? Indeed I did. For I sat in my father's throne room, heartbroken. I could not hold to the wisdom the master had given me. Somehow it was not relevant to me, to the very moment of my life as I lived for the past. I avoided Master Payan, angry with him. Why was he not there to save my mother and sister? I shouted these questions inwardly, made these complaints in my heart. I wandered the jungles alone, and then one day, when I thought I was alone, I screamed at the mountains, Why did they have to die? A voice called over my shoulder. Because it was their time, Jashibian. It was my not. He had been tracking me. I tried to run past him, but he snagged me with his long arms. I writhed, kicked, screamed, Leave me alone! But I could not get free. Minot held me until I finally relaxed. Now sit, he said. I obeyed. Wipe those tears, Jashibian. I obeyed. We were quiet for a while. He then said, Do you think you are the only child? Our mother left behind, the only sibling Anya left behind. I had not thought of that. Everyone in the palace, everyone loved them, and was loved by them. Sorry, I sobbed. I'm sorry. I understand you're confused, but do you see how you think that you're so special? And how you forget the rest of us here with you. Sorry. Do you see how that makes me feel? Makes Botash feel, Kuba, Seleth? I know, I whined. This is life, Minot declared, 
and that angered me. I don't like it. And there it was. My rejection of life as it was, because I was clamoring for an idea. A past love. As the master said I would. This is life, Minot said. I don't like it! I screamed in contempt, and then he shook me, his large hands on my shoulders. This is life! He yelled at me, not accepting my unreasonableness. And I calmed down. This is life, brother. You cannot change it, he said, and he let me calm down even more before saying, What is your duty in life, do you remember? Or have you so easily thrown out what the Master has taught you and decided instead to be a spoiled brat? Use what he gave you. What is your duty? Tell me right now or I'll be so mad at you just should be and call Ronnie that to manage love, I said. I could not bear my not being mad at me. Even when my not pressed. To manage love, even when it seems impossible. So have you spoken to Master Payan since? Have you expressed your grief in knowing his devotee? was taken away from him. No. I broke into tears, now seeing the cruelty of my privacy. I'm sorry, I said. You might want to tell him that. You're not the only one hurt by this brother. We are all survivors and all obligated to help one another heal. Okay. I said as I squirmed and sniffed. Let's go home, Minot suggested. I saw that day why I loved my brother. I knew that day what it was Payan loved in Minot as well, or in this moment Minot, who was dealt this blow we both endured and still managed to straighten me out and stand with so much grace showed me so much strength. Out of all my brothers, indeed, Minot stood out, shone, and did not hide in his grief. Instead, he came to us all. With him near the thorn was removed from my heart, and I knew from that moment on, as he looked at me sternly, that Minot expected to see me standing more strongly on my feet from now on. I hadn't the clarity to see it then, but my mother's death made way for my seeing my not in this totally different light. Though frustrated and seeming to be confused at times, my not was Payan's devotee. Payan looked on him with the same sternness as my not was now looking on me. I could no longer run now and Minot would no longer console me. Instead, he reminded me of what our master taught, to see the bigger picture, to love. To love, as the mosquito draws blood, the wasp breaks the skin, the snake bites, only to love. To love while the tiger hunts, the brother betrays, and the mother dies, only to love. To love while all else fails, but never to fail at remembering and holding to love for, as the Master had taught me, to fail at loving was truly to fail at noticing who I really was. Minot pushed me past my grief and took loving care of me, fed me the strength he stood with. We rode together much of that summer, mostly alone, but often times with Darlian, whose heart was also torn by our mother and sister's departure. Minot did well to keep us together, the three of us, to focus us, to let Suan and Anya go, and to heal. <laughs>